Okay, I think we are live. Tuko, tuko barra, barra, kabisa. Okay, the person who's supposed to give us a speech is over here running. Literally leaning. <laughs> Saya, you know that moment is on the internet. Okay. Okay, Saya, Saya start, start us off. Um, welcome again. My name is Saya Jackson, and I am a life and transition coach. I come alongside individuals who are navigating life transitions so that they don't lose their voice, vision, or their values. We should have picked the hints sooner. When children on the playground elbowed each other or gave each other signals to come home to eat in a manner that was discreet so that others would not be able to tell. We should have picked the hint sooner when what you carried in your brick tin or not carried in your brick tin to school determined your sense of worth on that particular day. And whether while others were producing their brick tins with pride, you hid yourself or tried to slide away so that people would not see that undesirable article of food or when you carried something that you thought popular, you made sure you opened and made a display so that your sense of esteem just beyond your stomach satisfaction could have been enhanced. We should have picked it sooner. When in high school, we elbowed each other out in the canteen for break, never mind, we'd just eaten three hours earlier our breakfast. Well, we excused it that all this mud and rush for food was just boys being boys and trying to make sure they can eat as much as they can during adolescence. But we must have picked up on the hints when, again, just barely two hours later, we'd be heaping mountains of food and coming up with all manner of antiques to get even more food or an extra piece of meat or an additional slice of bread or a second round of serving. We should have picked up on the hints later when all that ever seemed to preoccupy our minds was food and its acquisition. Well, that's if we were not thinking about exams or cuts or avoiding that punishment. But we should have picked the hint late, uh, um, sooner. When girls in their teenage, who should be eating more because the um, growth spurt requires so were more ashamed and more concerned about their waistline and their looks. And they did everything they could to hide their desire for food and try to balance it with the desire to look good. We should have picked the hints sooner. When we were in public and when people asked us if we were hungry, we turned to our mothers as if they held the keys and the sphincters to our belly. We should have picked the hints sooner. When We've constructed an entire ethos of taboos and regulations, just basically around food. We should have picked this in sooner. When on the wedding queue and even on the funeral queue, people are still jostling as if the entire event is around the pot and not the people. We should have picked the hint sooner. When we created a whole language and ethos just around food and your behavior was determined around your behavior around food and your character was equated to that of an animal that you ate like you're either ravenous as a as a you're either ravenous as a hyena or you barely ate like a cat we should have picked the hint sooner that as we grow older we summarize our entire life with my ability to provide the daily bread what do you put on the table they say we should have picked this in sooner. When our brothers were vomiting their way to look into shape, our sisters were binge eating to look a certain way. We should have picked this in sooner. When we began retreating more and more deeper and being able to push people out and begin to use food as our medicine, as our comfort, as our companion, we should have picked it sooner. 
when suddenly a whole generation came up that had to photograph their food and display it on the internet for it to be consumed, suddenly it appeared that the enzymes had forgotten their job and needed to be reminded what was being eaten, where it was being eaten, with whom it was being eaten, for them to be able to determine whether they would produce sucrose or sucrase or they would produce tylene. It seems the enzymes had forgotten their work and needed a photographic reminder to do their job. We should have picked the hints sooner. But maybe we all were too distracted or maybe too naive to admit that there is an inadvertible link between our mental health, its display, and food. But the two are too interlinked. Maybe we too were all so immersed, so immersed into all of these things. But wait, today, we don't want to kick this ball down the road. We want to pause and come through these memories, come through these present realities and begin asking ourselves, is it possible that there is a big link between our mental health and our food? But beyond finding out if the link is there, answer the question, what should we do to become better mentally health so that we are not controlled by what we eat, but we control what we eat? Back to you in studio. I know you write one word and then come up with the whole poem. You need to, to put that somewhere, write it and, and, and then we share it. It's, you know, I don't praise my own siblings. But that was beautiful. <laughs> Very well done. Yeah, you need to write it down. If you want the, we can look back at this um, at the beginning of the video and then write it down, type it. I can, no, I'm not happy for it, you type it. Anyway, where do we start? Oh, so, so let's start from, from just the definition. Um, Sh Sharon, because you're a nutritionist, what's nutrition and what's diet and any other thing that we interchange and say, Mother Godanio, but just tell us what, the, what, what those two are, what's the difference? Um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sharon Ogugu. I am a nutrition and health coach. Well, I'm a health coach and a nutritionist. Um, when uh, we talk about nutrition, I mean, we, we have like the dictionary definition, we have the, the one we were taught in school, but I like to think of nutrition as how the body uses food and actual food. There's so later we will talk a little about um, items that mimic the look and taste of food, what we commonly call junk. But nutrition is basically a study or an understanding of how the body uses food. Um, and food also covers beverages, drinks, etc. cetera. Um, food itself, and, and I know it seems like something really obvious, like why are we even defining what food is, is um, something that we consume to get nutrients that are necessary for us to live, to just live for starters and for us to be healthy. So um, there are major food groups and I do want to mention them because some of them have been vilified. Um, and, and we were taught they're carbohydrates, uh, they're protein, then there's fat, and then there's, uh, well, there's macro, micro, anyway. And then there's, um, uh, minerals and vitamins. Then in vitamins, we have fat soluble and water soluble vitamins. Now, why it is, did I mention protein? I hope I mentioned protein. So, why it is important uh, for me to have started with carbohydrates is that that's one of the groups that we should be consuming the most of. And we don't because we live in a day and age where anyone who has read anything about nutrition, whether it is on the internet or elsewhere, will tell you that carbs are bad. I, I, I don't know where we got, I know where we got that idea. I, when we look at diet history and whatnot, um, but that's, that's a very blanket and general statement. And it is a very unfair statement to make about carbohydrates. So we will come back to it. Um, and then there's the other one that has been vilified. Under carbohydrates, we have sugar. People generally think sugar is fat. Stay away from sugar, sugar is the devil. And yet uh, sugar isn't just table sugar, what we add to our tea and coffee. Sugar is also found in fruit. Certain people who um, eat a certain way, who restrict their eating, who cut out sugar, who believe or have been told or taught that sugar is bad, 
will very often also avoid sweet fruit. So I've heard people say, and I've initially had clients who come off very restrictive diets come and say, pineapples are bad because they're very high in sugar. And when you take any fruits that are high in sugar, you activate your insulin. There are phrases that are used which would make anyone who has any medical or science background just lose their minds because insulin is essentially released to deal with sugar, which is when food is broken down, it's a whole thing. But so that we don't complicate it and take you back to biology class, because that might be triggering for some people. Um, let's just say sugar is in just blanket bad. Not all sweet fruit is bad. There are people who have to limit their intake of sweet fruit, such as diabetics, but sugar is not necessarily just classed as bad. And lastly, there is fat. People think fat was created equal, and yet um, certain fats are good for us. Uh, avocado is uh, a fruit that's very high in fat, but the fat that it is high in is good for you. Omega-3 oils, which are found in uh, fatty fish and also found in, uh, say, flax seeds. And I need to mention that the flax seeds need to be ground so that you find what is inside the seed itself. These are healthy fats and they're good for you. And we do need to find a way to strike a balance. If there's anything we're going to learn today, it's how to find a balance so that we are not never ever eating cake at all because cake is evil or it's bad or it's not good for you, it's unhealthy. You know those very strict labels we have on food that we will learn how to be okay with having a slice of cake, preferably after we have eaten a meal. Um, so not all fats are good, not all fats are bad. So saying fat is bad or carbohydrates are bad or unhealthy is an unfair and untrue blanket statement. Then the last one is diet. Um, to diet is basically to restrict how you eat. So there are people who do need to diet. There are people who have to eat a certain way because of certain conditions that they uh, have. So for instance, people who have, I keep mentioning type 2 diabetes, uh, need to eat foods that are very high in fiber to control their blood sugar. So that instead of having spikes, where their sugar just keeps going up and down and up and down because they have a problem with producing insulin, that they have very little that is produced. Um, or if they have type 1 diabetes, which is called insulin-dependent diabetes, they are not producing any, so they have to inject themselves with insulin. They have to make measures to regulate their blood sugar. Food generally, when it is broken down after digestion, becomes sugar. It's not the only thing it becomes, but a lot of it becomes sugar. And so that's why we talk about blood sugar, blood glucose. So when you have a diabetic or you are a diabetic, those are some of the things you need to pay attention to. Why do we pay attention to a fiber? We are thinking, let's not spike the sugar too high and bring it down too low. Let's see if we can raise it up and then have it sit there for a while, then come down after a few hours. How do we achieve that? By eating fiber-rich foods, such as leafy green vegetables and fruits. Uh, again, depending on what you're managing. People who've been told that they're hypertensive or borderline hypertensive will be told cut down on sodium, which is found primarily in salt. Now, salt is also hidden in processed foods, junk, snacks, etc. So dieting is necessary when you're managing a condition, but it's also necessary. Um, it's also a way that uh, people have learned to identify themselves. There are people who identify as vegetarian, meaning they do not eat um, Certain, they don't eat meat, but they consume certain animal products such as dairy and eggs. There are other people who identify as vegan. They do not consume anything, not honey, not eggs, not milk, just plant-based foods. Then there are others who even say they are whole foods plant-based. So they only consume foods as close as possible as they were when they came from the ground. So from the ground, so that's maize. They will avoid anything that is processed, etc. We are going to delve into how. Um, that can be a foundation, like fixating on this is how I eat and this is my identity can lead to uh, certain fixations that become unhealthy. Um, I feel like I have gone about answering those questions. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so Austin, you're up. Um, so chicken and egg, between this is the, 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 the relationship between mental health and, um, and nutrition whatever Sharon to tighter to nutrition I'm a dad we will use the words interchangeably not correctly uh, but interchangeably so who begets who 
I don't know if you understand or I need um, to to I will, your, I will yeah. I will try to, to answer your question. Um but before answering, I want to get a quote that we had from uh, this guy who invented electricity, um, Thomas Edison. Um, he said that the doctor of the future will no longer treat the human frame with drugs, but rather will cure and prevent disease with nutrition. And so you can imagine, um, this is someone who was talking in the 1890s, uh, the early 19th century, talking and saying that a lot of times, a lot of our diseases can be prevented using nutrition. And indeed you have heard of uh, lifestyle diseases these days, uh, people talking about nutrition, the role it plays. But one of the things that we ask ourselves as a psychologist, um, because most times in our psychological training, we hardly, interact with nutrition, or we hardly interact with um, biochemistry, um, unless you had a biochemical or a nutrition background as, a, as an undergraduate student. But one of the things we've learned, um, like for me, what I've learned while interacting with, uh, with, with many of our clients is that the brain uh, really has a role in how we function. And a lot of times the food that we eat has an impact on the brain. So you'll find, um, as, as my colleague has mentioned, uh, you find there are certain foods that influence the health of the brain. So whether it's the protein, um, whether someone is actually eating complex carbohydrates, uh, whether someone is eating uh, foods in uh, omega-3 fat, uh, like the fish, salmon, uh, whether someone is using olive oil or canola, well, you find that some, some, some of these foods are actually essential in uh, improving the brain function. The other thing that we also know is the timing of the feeding. Um, so for example, there are people who do not have breakfast, or sometimes there are people who eat certain foods uh, at lunch and, interfere, and it interferes with their mental clarity. Uh, you've heard people say that you're eating ugali and fish for lunch, and that's a lullaby, you're going to sleep in the afternoon. So you find, uh, again, we reflect also, what, what time do you eat and what, what exactly are you eating? So that has an impact on, on your brain function. The other thing that we also look at is the, is, is the, is the issue of how an individual is managing their feeding and what it has in terms of their brain health. So for me, when I'm working with, the, with clients, there are certain things the clients will tell me when they're managing their nutrition. Number one is the issue of uh, self-efficacy, that if I am able to control what I am eating, um, it also has an impact on my emotions. Uh, as an individual, maybe I have control on uh, what I decide to do to improve on the health of my body. And a lot of times when we ask our clients to reflect like having a food diet, a food plan or a food journal, a lot of times they will say that it has made them to be more self-aware, that now I'm aware in terms of what I'm eating, I'm aware of uh, how my moods are influenced by what I'm eating. Um, and sometimes um, the food also influences my mood. The other thing that we, we have looked at is the issue of neurotransmitters. So those of us with a biological background or a medical background, um, a psychiatric background, they will, talk, they will talk about neurotransmitters. And for many, many times, the neurotransmitters are really um, how our bodies, how the different parts of the body are really co co communicating with the brain. And the health of the neurotransmitters is influenced by the nutrition. So if someone eats healthy, healthier, um, they'll be able to restore their neuro neurotransmitters. Um, and a lot of times stress uh, has an impact on the neurotransmitters. Uh, substance abuse has an impact on the neurotransmitters. Um, poor eating habits. Um, so. We'll, we'll hear more about the poor eating habits that we, we are presented with. Um, Sharon is really going to tell, take us through some of that. 
uh, in terms of our poor eating habits. Um, then also uh, other times we've heard of uh, clients using supplements. So you'll find there's a lot of information online. Uh, you are told to take this supplement or not to take this supplement. So even us, as we're doing counseling, we'll hear our clients talking about, oh, I'm using amino acids or I'm using uh, certain minerals that I bought in the pharmacy. I'm using certain vitamins that I bought in the pharmacy. And a lot of times, us as counselors, we are not quite sure, okay, what, what is the chemical composition of these neurotransmitters? I mean, um, supplements and how, what impact does it have on the individual's neurotransmitters? Um, because of working in addiction, sometimes I ask myself if uh, supplements are actually addictive um, in the sense that maybe the individual has gotten used to using them and now they feel psychologically that they are not okay if they don't use those uh, supplements. So finally is the issue about finances. I think the element of if you eat healthy and you live a healthy life, do you save money in the long run? Um, so of course, the socioeconomics will also start to say that um, maybe when you have a healthy lifestyle, you're able to, pre to prevent diseases and based on that prevention, then you eventually you reduce costs for mental health and also costs for physical health when you go for treatment. So those are some of the interactions that sometimes we have with our clients in terms of uh, nutrition and mental health. And a lot of times you find there is a shame surrounding mental health uh, and uh, substance abuse. Um, and sometimes our clients will be telling us that they are doing everything right uh, and it is still not enough. And for us, uh, we realize that when someone, for example, comes into a rehab, they're going through detoxification, we've put them on a nutrition plan, um, they are starting to become healthy. Sometimes we also get cross addiction. Cross addiction in the sense that maybe I stop using heroin or cocaine and I start getting addicted to coffee or sugar. So of course, then we start to, to, to use um, nutritional counseling for them to be able to know that, oh, um, there is what um, is going on in my biochemistry and I need to understand that my biochemistry plays a part in my mental health and my food influences my biochemistry. So that's how I'll try to frame the relationship. Back to studio. Oh, and thank you. So, so that means nutritionist nerds are hanging, I, I mean, psychiatrists and psychologists are hanging out with nutritionists. I don't think that was my experience well, because I did my rotation in Madare. So that maybe that's why. I, I, it's, it's for in, in ideal circumstances, um, mm -hmm. if you have a comprehensive treatment program, the nutritionist should also be part of the assessment at admission, uh, also during the person's uh, treatment and also at discharge. Um, so for example, you get a substance abuser who's HIV positive, or you get um, a depressed client who has a, a multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. So you'll find there's always that kind of interaction depending on the diagnosis that the client is having. But generally, um, we also find even if, are, if the person is quote unquote nutritionally healthy, the nutritionist also plays a part in the health education and health promotion for the individual and their families. So yes, um, for the ideal treatment facilities, we work with nutritionists, we work with psychiatrists, we work with psychologists in our treatment team. Okay. Um, so so uh, in, in essence, it's uh, the holistic um, view, looking at the patient as a whole, not as, as this disease only. Uh, not yes, my yes. hypertension and my, my diabetes, yes. I'm looking at, at you as, as, at me as POSA. Okay. That's, that's yes, because what, what happens is that you find um, there is the model, the treatment model that is currently used in many of the facilities. Um, we talk about bio, psychosocial, stroke, spiritual treatment model. So on the bio part, you have the medical doctor, the psychiatrist, and the nutritionist working hand in hand. Sawa, sawa. Hey, Sharon. Let me see how to frame this question. 
Uh, so, so <laughs> yeah, because nutrition is hard. I mean, and medical school sucks for nutrition. We, it's pathetic. If you're going to a doctor for nutritional advice, they must have had uh, undergone like a whole nutritional on their own. It's not from med school. I think um, the only studies we do are on malnutrition and not just nutrition itself. Okay, so Sharon, you're hanging out with Austin. Let's do the do's, as in what, and then we will tackle, I don't know where, because that's, that's okay. If you look at Helen's question, then frame it in your head, then we will answer it later. But I'm just, um, you're hanging out with Austin as uh, you're looking at, uh, let me use me as an example, as POSA, and you want, what are the do's? What are you helping me? What are the do's? Just go ahead. Kizungu Misha. You know, I, no, and I totally understand your frustration because uh, I am calling it frustration for lack of a better word because sometimes you so it's overwhelmed really. There yeah. are so many things that you're looking to address at the same time, <clears throat> and especially in healthcare, you're like, where do I start? So, um, the one question that I I love to ask at the beginning, or that has been very effective in getting as much action, um, a self drive involvement you know having a person own their own health is the question why so when when i have when i'm hanging out with austin and he's referred a client to me or we have a client we we are working uh with together the the first question i've asked is why 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 are we here what are some of the things that you think are problematic because i'm obviously here because there's something that you feel you're either not dealing with uh as well as you'd like to or that you're struggling with and so many, many of the whys are rooted in feelings of inadequacy and shame. Um, and a lot of them are also rooted in learned behavior. So, and, and Austin, I feel, has covered a lot of it. But it's when, when a client is coming to see me, sometimes they will come and say that they are struggling with their weight or they want to lose weight. And then I'll ask them, okay, why? Why is this important to you? And they're like, no, but I need to lose weight. But, but why? And as I, I think I mentioned in the previous video we had, um, they will sometimes get upset because they're like, it's obvious. If I am heavy set, I should lose weight. But then I'm like, define health for yourself. And in fact, I think that that could be the starting point. You, you say you want to be healthy, but what does healthy mean for you? Paint a picture of what healthy means for you. And if you keep pushing that question and pushing and asking them to just allow you to hear what they're not saying, then you'll often hear, I just want to be able to go up the steps, you know, without my knees hurting. I just want to be able to picture myself attending my child's wedding because the way I'm going, I'm not sure. Or I just like to be able to have enough energy to get out of bed before 12 noon. So sometimes that is what will cause me to go back to Austin and tell him, uh, side note, did they mention that they are not getting out of bed in the morning? Because sometimes some things just show up. Um, so why is definitely one of the questions, what's, what's brought you here to me in particular about your health, your nutrition, and how do you define good health for yourself? Um, the other thing I like to look out for is, so for me, let me give a little history. When I started out, I focused mostly on nutrition because that's how I was taught. Nutrition is take diet history, find out what they can access in the market, tell them to eat that, send them away you know, keep warm and well-fed. But then uh, later I started to notice that people were not making as much progress and there were other underlying factors affecting said nutrition. So now when I work with clients, I focus on uh, hydration and hydration is basically to mean what fluids, fluids are they taking? Again, we live in a day and age where green smoothies are the new thing. It's, if it's green and it's in a juice, so it's a smoothie, then it is healthy. People are not asking questions about um, where did they get this information and do they have underlying issues that would make drinking smoothies and juices constantly or large amounts of the same problematic. It's never one size fits all. So I we and under hydration, we also address water intake. Um, one of the most uncomfortable questions I think for human beings to answer, especially in my office, is what is coming out of your body? Does your pee look like cocoa pine? Does it look orange? Does it look yellow? Does it? And the people who honestly don't look, they go, they finish, they flash because some of these things are still taboo in our day and age. 
and uh, when you wipe, is there blood? Um, the, what is the consistency of your stool? Is it snake-like, banana-like, or does it look like goat dung? And there are people who are genuinely surprised when I ask these questions, They're like, wait, I'm supposed to check, or is it bad if it looks a certain way? And I didn't know. And I'm like, yes, there's, there's a chart for how, what comes out of your body should look, or what is or isn't normal. And um, then we also talk about sleep. Now, uh, I like that Austin has also mentioned the fact that there are people who sleep very late. And when you sleep late, shift workers, you know, people who have turned around their sleeping clock, that affects how you eat. If um, you have trouble sleeping, if you're an insomniac, for many people like that, you have a depressed appetite. If you eat very late at night, you have a depressed appetite in the morning. That is, you're not very hungry in the morning. And so you find yourself maybe going off on a coffee or a cup of tea in the morning and you're fine. And then at 11, you find yourself feeling hungry. So these are just some of the things that I'm looking out for to hear whether they're eating in what I call the standard way, in an ideal world, are they waking up hungry to breakfast, to, to have breakfast, which is breaking a fast? Are they sleeping roughly seven to eight hours? Sleep is the other thing that we address. So, and also physical activity, because we cannot talk about, it's always been diet and exercise. I don't like to use the word exercise because it's very triggering for some people, one. Uh, and two, many people think of exercise as going to the gym. I talk about movement and physical activity. So for instance, my business partner is a yoga instructor. I like yoga because it is accessible to everyone. If you do not have enough money to go to the gym, you can do it. If you have a carpet in the house, you can do it. If you have, as long as you have a solid surface somewhere, there are forms of exercise you can enjoy at home. If that is too Eastern religion for you, then uh, you can engage in walking. I always like to ask people, What's, a physical, what's an activity you enjoy? For some of them, it's dancing. Oh gosh, I used to dance in school or in college. I sort of stopped doing that. And I tell them, go back to that first love. Go back to the things that give you joy. Because we're also looking for dopamine hits. We live in a hard world. You're busy, you have kids, you have your partner, you have a job. You may or may not like, you know, the economy is crap. So what are the things that give you joy? So that we also learn how to settle for bare minimums. Because again, we live in a world where we understand health as all or nothing. I'm either eating leafy green vegetables at every single meal, three times a day, drinking a lot of water, going, exercising, going to the gym. If I fail at one point, then, ah, oh, man, I messed up. Let's start again next week on Monday. So we think of health as, very many of us actually think of health as doing all the good things. And if I fail at one point, and that's putting a lot of unrealistic pressure, I mean, expectations on yourself and pressure on yourself. So there are people who don't try because again, depending on where they had it, sometimes it's their doctors who told them or it's their parents who told them that, oh no, if you're doing that, it's useless. You know, no, this, sh this is how it should be done. So depending on where they're getting their messaging from. This also goes on to, um, um, to... so the other challenge that we often have is if I am saying one thing, and my client or my patient's uh, doctor or psychologist is saying another thing, there tends to be a big problem because then who do I trust? Um, and that's a big concern for clients, which is why, again, if I'm having a meeting with Austin, a psychologist or a doctor, I like to talk to them and tell them we need to be on the same page about certain things or at least not give our patient or our client conflicting information because that winds up harming them. We get to leave them to go make their decisions, but we wind up harming them. So we are seeking to do good, not harm. So let's speak the same language. It's a conversation I usually like to have with um, my clients, doctors, and whatnot. Yeah, so that's essentially what I usually look out for. The, let's talk about the why. Let's talk about your sleep. Let's talk about hydration. What fluids are you taking? And including alcohol, by the way. Let's talk about what, what habits do you generally have with sleep. We also talk about your phone habits. Very many of us go to bed with our phones. And then let's talk about your movement. Do you move if you don't uh, go to the gym or if you don't have a regular exercise regime? How can you start small but just start doing something, whether it's waking up to dance to a song you love for five minutes and then building up over the weeks? Um, small changes over a long period of time or gradually are always better than large sweeping changes that you cannot sustain. Uh, back to you in studio. Oh, back to, yes, I am here. So, so in the quest for chasing the neurotransmitters that um, Austin uh, mentioned um, and, and 
regarding this question that Christi, my friend Christine has asked, just just talk about you know that the 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 way people are going to the um buying all these things from Amazon and all these um things kupuasu and murumuru you know I've been there um in the quest for chasing um these neurotransmitters and why is nutritional advice so you know like if we are treating malaria the variation would be very little. Mm. Why is nutritional advice, so two questions, why is nutritional advice very confusing? And two, in the quest for chasing neurotransmitters, are we going to the Amazon or is there a shorter way to get, a shorter, easier, accessible way to get there? And then you, um, for my people in Mulwahi who have fit latrines and can't look at their poop and their, and their urine, what, how do you address them? Okay. Um, let me start with why nutrition is so such a sticky, it's like almost overloaded subject these days. It's everywhere. The internet has information about nutrition and misinformation about nutrition, and it's everywhere. And my concern is like very many, um, and this is not to lash out with anyone, but doctors give nutrition advice, nurses give nutrition advice, personal trainers give nutrition advice. Anyone who's gone on a weight loss journey successfully, depending on how they term success or understand it, is can give nutrition advice. Um, anyone on the spectrum who's done a short course online with some international body can give nutrition advice. Anyone who says they're a licensed health coach gives nutrition advice. So it's, it's tricky because all this information and misinformation is out there. One, two, we do live in a society that believes in, if I see it, then I believe it. So if I see that someone has a six pack and they are selling a program and um, they're saying, look, you are having hormonal imbalance issues and it is because you are eating this and this is how you should eat if you want to look like me. I have been talking to very many people. I have a thousand clients. And so people will be, oh, and by the way, this person has 10K followers on Instagram, then for sure, they surely have something to say. And that's how a lot of misinformation is passed. That's why nutrition is so tricky. And also there are people who've written books saying that carnivorous diet is the way to go or because there's evolution, um, we should go on the paleontology diet because that's how our forefathers ate and they did not have any illnesses. Forgetting to factor in that we don't live like our forefathers did. We don't live in huts and caves and whatnot, and we don't chase after our food on foot. But like people essentially just take up a lot of information. Media is very deceptive as well, just mainstream media, because um, we, we sell, you know, we sell health knowing that we are pegging it on people's insecurities. And and media knows this. That's why the diet culture has changed so much, but it is still such a powerful multi-million industry. Supplement selling and selling diets and, and exercise regimes and personal training programs. It's pegged off of people's insecurity, people's fear. That's why, the, you know, even the way the messages are passed on are just to appeal to people's um, humanity in a way that sort of praise on their vulnerability. And so it's very easy to catch people when you tell them, you know, I also used to be sick and I changed my life when I started eating a certain way. And look at me now, I'm vibrant. I have a great life. I have a fantastic family. So you, you're basically drawing, when you're saying, putting out an ad like that or an information like that about your product or your good um, or your service, you're basically using the fact that people desire health um, we live in a culture that celebrates being slim, skinny, or athletic. We live in a culture where there's a lot of fat phobia, there's a lot of fat shaming. So to be, and, and skinny, thin is power. It is power. People treat you very differently when you look a certain way. People treat you very differently when you don't look a certain way. So if someone walks into a room and they're doing a presentation and they have a body like mine, very athletic, put together, flat stomach, people pay attention. But, um, I, and I've sat in an audience where someone is giving a presentation, they have a lot to share, they're incredibly smart, but because they have bulges, someone is more focused on like, why did they wear that dress? My God, like, look at how they're showing their fat. And I'm like, but what does that have to do with what they're talking about? Like, you know? And I think it's because of occupational hazard. I have worked with people who I, I'm not, I may not necessarily see um, them as one thing, but in society generally, 
And we see it even with our politicians. If they look a certain way and they say something, we create memes about them. When someone has something to say and it's important, but they look a certain way, they are not the standard of beauty, then we judge them differently. So this is part of what is going on. We have an idea of healthy as skinny or slim or athletic looking, and you will be treated differently. And we also have a lot of misinformation on the internet, not just on the internet, but even some of our healthcare providers are giving wrong information. Very few healthcare providers are okay with saying, I don't know, I need to go do research. Very few. They were very humbling, again, because this person comes to you expecting that you know. So those are just some of the challenges that uh, we, we go through. So I tell people, please find a healthcare professional in a professional setting. I, I, I would rather you talk to someone who, I believe in word of mouth. I, I don't recommend what I don't do. So if I, for instance, I'm looking for something as as what, as intimate, like as uh, um, I'm trying to figure out who to talk to as a therapist, I like to call them up. I'll ask a friend, hey, how did you deal with this situation that is probably similar to mine? And then ask them to refer someone to me and then call said person, put my feelers out. And if my gut tells me this person is not listening to me or they're just looking to push a product, then those are some of the things I look out for and go like, eh, I don't think this person is a good fit for me. Secondly, um, even when people say they've done health and wellness programs, ask them how they did six months, one year, two years after the program. We usually label success as what happens while you're doing something. I ask myself, is this person giving you tools to survive after? And this applies for me with whether it's therapy, whether it's nutrition care, whether it's um, just health care when you're seeing a doctor. Have they empowered you enough? given you enough tools for you to be able to, when you go out into the world, thrive. When you go into a crisis, you know what to do. You don't constantly have to call them and consult and find out. And it does take time to get to that place. So those are some of the things I, I tell people to look out for. Look for someone who will hold your hand for a time, but they will empower you with tools so that when you leave their office or when you stop consulting with them, six months, one year, two years down the line, what they taught you, the lessons you picked from those sessions, can carry you through, can carry you through, and it's information you can pass on that's helpful, and it's empowering. It's not, so how did you manage this? I don't really know. They just gave me pills to take. No, it's how do you manage this? So I learned your learning. You know, I did. There are certain actions that you're taking, et cetera. Those are some of the things I'd look out for when looking for uh, someone to recommend when, with regard to just taking care of your health, physical and mental health. There's another question you asked, which I don't remember now. Because in the are... quest for chasing for neurotransmitters, the yeah, whole yeah. superfood um, industry. So superfood obsession, of course, is it's, the, the other day, it, it's still CMOS, I think. I don't know if there's a new one. I stopped looking. But there's, there's been CMOS, there's chia seeds, there's, there's, there's always something. There's a drink, there's green tea. Um, and I tell people who come to me with these questions, any individual really who comes to me with these questions, I tell them, if this thing didn't exist, if you didn't know about it because it just blew up last week, last month, what, how would you go about life without it? And I'm not, I'm not saying that um, chia seeds are not healthy, they are. And I'm not saying, I'm not dismissing sea moss or seaweed as being beneficial for endometriosis or whatever. I'm just saying, if you do not have this thing, how will you live your life? How will you still access help? Because it's, it's, it's how you live your life every day that counts. Um, we, we have, again, a tendency to think of health as all or nothing, one, and two, a particular way. If I do this one thing, it will change. No, if you want to enjoy good health, you're doing many different things. Um, and maybe not at the very same time, but at least you're working towards doing many different things. So you are focusing on your diet. That's what you're putting into your body. You're focusing on your sleep. You're focusing on your physical and mental health. So you're also exercising. So essentially, I tell people, step away from the supplement for some time and just ask yourself, if I don't have it, what happens? Will I die or will I stop thriving? If we run out of CMOS today in the world, what will happen? Will you continue to eat the way you're still eating? Or what will you need to adjust in order to be able to still live well? For the people in um, 
I forget the name of the village, but in the village who are mm -hmm. not able to, you know, look down at WC and, and see what is coming out of their bodies. I'll, I'll, um, what I tell them to do is, so with regard to stool, when they wipe, they should check, should find out what, that, what the residue looks like. Also look out for blood. If, um, then look out for other things. Do you have pain after you've eaten a certain food? Do you get gassy when you eat a certain food? Do you get uncomfortable? There, there's something that you, is. how do you feel when you eat food A, B, C, D? And then, then what food combinations are not working for you? I like again that uh, Dr. Austin mentioned keeping a food diary. Most of my clients hate doing that. It's just like an extra job that they don't want to do. And I tell them then take pictures. When Jackson Sire was mentioning taking pictures of food, that's what my Instagram profile looks like. But essentially, it's also to normalize normal food, eating giveri for breakfast, having porridge, et cetera. But um, I tell them, do bare minimums. If all you can do is take a picture of what you're eating just to, so that at the end of the week, you're assessing what you've been eating in the course of the week. When you have all those images in front of you, you're able to go like, oh, wait, there, this color green is not featuring here at all. Or oh, a lot of my food is white. Or oh, a lot of it is brown. And that could tell you something. Or all my breakfasts are just a cup of black coffee and nothing else. And then at 11, I'm noticing I'm grazing through a lot of sweet things because I was so hungry to begin with. And those are the questions we'd like to ask ourselves. Because caffeine, for instance, masks fatigue. Very many of us are waking up to have that cup of coffee. Not really, not always because we are not hungry, but because we really just have to rush out of the house and we don't want to start making decisions about what we're eating or cooking or preparing in the morning while we have an eight to five and all these other things to deal with in life. So those are the things. Depending on the, the, the setting, I'll just ask questions depending on what your typical day looks like. And we'll paint a picture for me about how your day looks like morning to evening. Okay, so what does, where do you stay? And that is where I used to, while in Kenya, visit my clients in their homes or in their offices, so that I'd have a look around at what they could use within reach to help them figure out what was, what they could change and how. Okay, and I'm just, I'm just wondering, um, the, the influence of, okay, this is a sad question. The influence of our cultures and how we were brought up, like you see, um, I really don't take mokimo because it's not my cultural food because I was not taught to eat mokimo. I, I eat something um, di um, similar to that. It's called omushenye, but it's a different uh, uh, tuba that's used in that, whatever. So I'm just wondering the influence of culture on what we eat, especially when you think about um, uh, the next question from, from Facebook. Um, when I'm advising people, because I do some advice people, I tell them to shop where the Indians shop. Because uh, Indians have been vegans and vegetarians for so long, and they have like, you know, vegetables that are not in Mulwahi. They're not your Mrendas and your, your, your Kundes. I'm just wondering what the influence of our culture is on what we eat. And if you could talk about, yeah, just, just, uh, sorry, just go ahead. I think um, of all the questions you've thrown, that's it, it, it's just to say, yes, there's an influence, and then I return it to studio. That's it. Um, for starters, Mishenya and Mokimo are two different things. Mokimo was a mistake. Uh, somebody, I think, was doing githeri, and it overcooked, and they just decided to uh, cook it in. Mishenya is a, or for those who don't know Mishenya, it's, um, it's the closest you'll come to mana. A biblical manner. We use sweet potatoes and beans and maize. And it's in, in Luya, when you're very full and you know that full until you're just barely breathing, it's called Oshenya. So the food is called Mshenya because um, of its sweetness. You, 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 if consuming it will lead you to the place of Oshenya. Just a piece of uh, fun fact. Um, Food is part of culture. Uh, like when you when you, it's impossible to dissect um, a culture um, in the in the in the traditional sense. You know nowadays there's hip hop culture, there's different other cultures. But when you think about culture, where there's tribe and there's language, some of the components that form a culture is its food, its diet. 
um, same as its music, its dress, its norms, and everything. Um, but there are two there, there are two things about um, our culture and food. One is our um, we we generally when cultures were being formed, like um, Africa or whichever, people ate what was available and what was known. Available here, either they farmed it or they bought it. Okay, um, and when you look carefully at communities that in in Africa, the kingdom stayed. Um, right next to us, what do we call now tribes are really kingdoms. The kingdoms stayed next to each other and they heavily influenced um, each other, some more than others. So we learned a lot from our neighboring communities. And this was helpful, um, especially for pastoralist communities whose bandwidth of food was generally smaller, given that their key food commodity was the animals they kept their interaction with the agricultural um, communities next to them helped them expand a, what they could um, buy or acquire. And two, even how they prepared it um, was, 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 was enhanced. So second thing about food and culture is there's a whole taboo system or norm system that is built around food. A, what you can eat at which stage, you know, there's all those things for um, pregnant women don't eat eggs. Um, those wisdom, you know, in that I think they had experienced is it salmonella or something. Of course, they hadn't separated it, but they just knew mm, generally when ladies eat eggs when they're pregnant, things don't go too well. So they, they created a taboo system before the science was there. But uh, some, of the, <laughs> some of the taboo system seems unfair. Um, I am Luya and I know... For instance, what part of a chicken is eaten by who is set in the in the in the culture? Certain parts are eaten by men, and I remember one of my relatives being very bitter about the gizzard is eaten by a man. The gizzard part of a chicken, but in 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 current restaurants you can just go order a plate of gizzards. And so, <laughs> one of my relatives had gone to a a male relative had gone to a um, one of those restaurants and. He, he he came back extremely offended at the idea of a lady just returning, um, go, going to the hotel and ordering a plate full of gizzards. And he, he couldn't understand how we are losing our culture. Uh, <laughs> like he, should, he was um, he was he was extremely he was not amused. Um, he used very strong um, expressions. It was very funny. <laughs> Still thinking about it cracks me up. Um, I apologize for that. So. Um, culture affects food because of the whole taboo system of what you can eat, when you can eat, um, how it can be um, eaten, even the eating order. In some cultures, um, women cooked the food but ate last. So the men ate and then um, the older men, then the younger men, then women and children ate. In some cultures that are a bit more sensitive, the children are made to eat fast or eat separately and stuff. So access to nutrition or access to food is definitely going to be affected with that. There's also the whole behavior of how to behave when you're offered food, um, which places you can eat, which places you cannot eat. Um, for a long time, for instance, the Kikuyu did not eat fish. They in fact regarded it as a snake. Um, and a lot of that also had to do with their view about the Luo. And because the Luo were tagged as being the fish eaters and fish smells a certain way. Um, but later down the road, we actually came to realize a, a good percentage of why the Kikuyu did not eat fish and therefore access what was possible in fish is had more to do with their lack of knowledge of how to prepare it like, you know, well. And when they learned, they were able to, to, do, to do it. But a lot of the stigma there was attached to other stigmas and stereotypes we have about with, with certain people. Um, so culture does affect um, food and eating at very, very, very many um, levels. And listening to both um, Austin and Sharon, it is true that at times before you can effectively change um, the diet habits of a people, you need to be able to help them address the culture. Because when we've migrated from 
our tribes and we have now formed new tribes in urban areas, even those tribes have certain um, cultures, have certain um, ideas, taboos, access um, around food. And you often need to ask, you know, so if these, um, the resident culture views a certain body shape, a certain way, it trickles right back to um, what you eat and what you don't eat. You know, funny thing is, again, I'm Luya, and I know this also happens in Nigeria. Um, Well-built, heavily built ladies are seen as beauty. They're interpreted as beautiful. In one Nigerian culture, there's actually a fattening house for prospective ladies. So when you're going to be married, you're put in a house where the whole objective is to be fed, okay, so that you get um, some flesh because there the interpretation of beauty is if you're, if you're thick and um, that's beautiful. It's a very opposite in many urban cultures where lean is seen as the thing. So depending on which culture you are functioning within, it's going to um, determine a lot of the way you interact ultimately with your food. So food does form a part of a culture, but a culture eventually ends up shaping through, through its influence on other subsets of the culture, like um, looks and access and acceptance and what's going to be praised, what's going to be punished, ends up influencing how people then engage and interact with food. And then location of the culture, whether it's urban or rural, also plays a big role in as far as access to various articles of food are concerned. And then thirdly is the attitude that that culture has to other cultures and their artifacts, including food, also plays a big role in influencing how people will engage with and access food that may not be resident or parent um, to their culture. That's, I think, a long answer to your short question. Back to your studio. Okay. Austin, you're not chopped liver. It's just that we have a nutritionist. So, Tulia Tupaleuko. Sharon, I know you've raised up your hand, but I just want us to, to, to be, before we go to the eating disorders, I just want, and body dysmorphia, I want us to address malnutrition. I know people just think of um, marasmus and kwashiako, but just, um, just give us a broad overview because that's a topic that's a whole chapter in, in nutrition and, and medical textbooks. And oh. whatever you had raised your hand up for. Yeah, okay. Um, I. I like to give short answers to that question because it's um because I feel like there are so many issues under, over, in, and at the root of malnutrition that I it's a biased opinion, but like prefer to address. So malnutrition, mal is like like the word malabsorption, mal is like impaired. Um, or or not right. It's just there's something off about you know um, your nutrition or your nutrient status. So malnutrition means there's something off. Okay. So malnutrition covers both undernutrition and overnutrition. And in undernutrition, that's where we find the kwashako and marasmus. That's where we find. And I like to paint pictures because as human beings, we tend to see problems in others easier than we see them in ourselves. We have that sort of bias. So these are the pictures I like to paint to help people see how undernutrition can occur in their households. Um, you start going to work and you leave your child, your young child, say whether an infant or um, a young child under the age of five in, in the care of your domestic uh, help. And unknown to you until this child starts to keep falling sick and you take them to hospital, what the child is typically fed is rice and cabbage, uh, ugali and maybe some vegetables, fr uh, rice fried with potatoes and, and tomatoes and onions. And then one day you take this child to hospital and, and they're just presenting with some strange symptoms. They're not gaining weight, their appetite is off, etc. And the doctor looks at you and tells you, what have you been feeding your child? They are undernourished. And you're shocked because you live in Nairobi. You, you are probably a lecturer at a university or you're a government official. So how is this malnutrition that occurs in Turkana occurring in your household? The elements of shame come in and uh, all the thoughts of, am I a bad mother for not having caught this? Those are some of the things that we see. 
So when um, whole food groups are ignored and the nutrition occurs. Um, so then also the opposite, um, overnutrition or rather an overconsumption of certain food groups with, um, and, and what will happen is if you're consuming one food group more than the other, then you're consuming less of, if you're consuming more food group A, then you're consuming less of B and C. And a typical thing that I have found in households that I have worked with is we usually remember the protein and the starch, we really disregard the vegetable. So people are very comfortable saying I'm vegetarian. So what do you eat? Rice and beans? Um, what do you eat? Uh, ugali and, and, and oh, in, in fact, this is a popular one. Very many people who eat ugali and yamachoma, you know, or grilled meat. And very many people forget to include vegetables. And, or they will tell you that, but I used tomatoes and onions and green peppers in the stew. So like I still have to add other green things to my food. I used coriander. And this, that, that basically has uh, shown me that very few of us actually understand the importance of, okay, if you have a plate, telling people the very things that we sometimes think are obvious. If you have a plate, you do need your carbohydrates. What are carbohydrates? It's your rice, it's your pasta, it's your potatoes, it's your ugali, it's, you know, the starchy foods, it's your root tubers, it's, it's your giveri, it's, well, mostly the maize, but also the beans partly, but it's, it's those are the things. Now, if you're eating giveri, you do need to have your vegetables as well. What are these vegetables? We are talking leafy greens, we are talking, whether it's managu, kunde, terere, whatever traditional vegetables, but preferably leafy greens because they're classed as some of the healthiest vegetables in the world. But if what you have access to is cabbage, try switch up between the normal white cabbage and purple cabbage. Um, and if you haven't given it a try, try spinach. Most people do not like sukuma wiki after high school, but try spinach or cabbage, but give it a try. And the other conversation I like to have with parents is just because you don't like a certain food, please don't deny the entire household an experience with it. I, for instance, went to high school in Limuru. We ate a lot of cabbage. I still get triggered by the smell of cabbage, but I have told, taught myself how to at least give it a try in a salad or have it once in a while, cooked with a boatload of tomatoes and garlic so that it can taste to my liking. I don't force myself to eat it, but I'm open to trying. And that's the openness I'd like for uh, people to address. With overnutrition, I tiptoe around this one because I also don't like sounding like a fat shamer, but we basically are talking about overweight and obesity. It comes with so many complications and so many crossovers of issues because very many of the people who struggle with uh, overweight and obesity or being overweight and obese also typically struggle with other things such as, but not limited to cardiovascular diseases, which include hypertension. Um, they're usually sometimes, not all the time, the diabetic or diabetic, et cetera. But this is not for everyone. This is not to, I need to stress this because there's a tendency in healthcare for sometimes someone to walk into an office, seeing a nutritionist or a doctor, and for it to be assumed that because you're overweight or because you look a certain way, you're thicker than the average person, then you surely must be struggling with something or that your symptoms have to do with your weight. That is not always true. I have met people who are fitter than I am, who are heavier than I am, who are almost twice my weight, but they are probably taking antidepressants and that has been linked to weight gain. Some of them are on birth control. So before we make assumptions about people, it is very important for us to have the full story. So that covers uh, malnutrition. So it's over nutrition and it is under nutrition. So the general... Um, no, just, and, just touch on also the micronutrients because it, it will answer the, the cravings part also. Yes, yes. And, and so the, the, the general advice I give people is always make sure that you're looking for balance. When we were taught about the balanced diet, it is old wisdom that, you know, is really still applicable. Make sure you do have your carbohydrates, you do have your vegetables, you do have your protein. If you're a vegetarian, make sure that you're taking your B12 supplements. And um, if you are, you know, if there's anything that you've left out, then make sure you're replacing it. If you've taken out the meat or you've taken out the eggs, get 
um, a good quality protein like soy or tofu to, to um, replace it. And do your research. Make sure you're looking for credible sources to get this advice. Micronutrient deficiency is really common. And that is why so many of us actually take supplements. And sometimes it presents in issues such as poor period health. Very many women have um, menstrual cramps and when they start taking magnesium and zinc, they start to improve. Like they, they don't have as heavy, uh, I mean, as painful periods as they used to have before. So micronutrient deficiencies are not as easy to spot sometimes until it is almost too late. Very many people have come to me complaining about having tingly feelings in their fingers or they're just tired all the time. And when I ask them what they typically eat and I realize that they eat almost the same thing every day or if they take milk and bread every day, I'm like, where are you getting your micronutrients? These are commonly found in, yes, your fruits and vegetables, but then it, they're also spread out through different food groups. One of the messages I preach a lot about on, on social media is, especially Instagram, because that's where I take pictures, eat the rainbow. Make sure your plate is colorful. If it is predominantly white or predominantly brown, there's a problem. If it only has two colors most days of the week, that is problematic. What you're targeting is bright red colors, bright yellows, purples, greens, um, just brightly colored fruits and vegetables that seem, are found to be generally by many studies very healthy. So eat your green grapes today, eat your red grapes tomorrow, eat the purple ones. Eat your eggplant today, eat your red cabbage today, eat your white cabbage tomorrow. Eat potatoes today, have rice tomorrow, have ugali the next day. Mix it up. And then use uh, herbs and spices. I don't know who told us herbs and spices are bad, um, but they're good for us. They're also very rich in antioxidants and they, they protect us from oxidative stress. So what we want to be doing is adding some turmeric, some black pepper, some cayenne pepper, oregano, basil, like all these things. They don't cost that much money for the average Kenyan. And I'm just using this loosely for the average Kenyan. And you just need about like a pinch over your food. You just need a little at a time, but it goes a long way. Take your garlic, take your ginger, normalize using that in your food because these are also good for your gut. These are also like, and there's a way that nutrients interact together. So normalize eating a complete meal with all the food groups represented, but also normalize eating two portions of fruit a day. And look for fruit in season. Look for, if now it is where oranges are going for five shillings, in I don't know if they go for five shillings anymore anywhere, but if you're going for 10 shillings in town and that's what you're seeing everywhere, then that means the fruit is in season. If you live on this other side of the globe, uh, go for the fruits that are easily, <laughs> I know you're shaking your head. Look for the ones that are easily available depending on the time. We are just coming out of winter. There are certain fruits that are not available. You also need to be, we are also concerned about things like, you know, uh, mold because of the distances that these foods have traveled, et cetera. Source for locally found foods. So when you have that person traveling to Mombasa and they're coming back, send them for the fruits and foods and nuts and seeds found easily there. Send them for the cashews, send them for the coconuts, the mangoes, etc. If you know someone who is visiting a farm elsewhere and they have access to has avocados in Naivasha, send them for those, then get them. You know, this is an investment in your health. I know very many of us are like, but it costs, but it costs. I've found that very many of the people, this is not for everyone, who complain about the cost of this, that, and the other, if they sat themselves down and called themselves to a meeting, they'd realize that if we pulled together and we said, we are visiting Posa's farm on this day and we are buying from her farm the watermelons that she grows or Sire's onions, then we would be able to cut back on costs, we'd be able to plan our meals better, we'd be able to eat better, because one, you know where the food is coming from. So that just basically covers tips on how to make sure you're eating healthy. It does also partly cover the question that's been asked about the neurotransmitter uh, ecosystem. We now hear a lot about gut health being linked to brain health. So what do we do with this information? How do we make it local? A lot of our foods, our African foods, are actually really good for the gut. Our mrenda, our cassava, our potatoes, our like these are foods, our yams are foods that are very good for us. Our peanut sauce paired with, with green bananas, cooked green bananas and managu on the side. These are actually foods that are good for us because they are very close to nature. They're close to the form in which they came from the ground. They're probably consumed, as uh, Jackson said, consumed 
soon after they were harvested and we grew them ourselves. We had an exchange system where if I had an excess of this, I would exchange with my neighbor or neighboring community. So we did have a system where we would eat these foods. And it is true, we need to go back to eating how um, our grandparents used to eat. Now, I'm going to um, go back and forth. With regard to mental health struggles, especially mood disorders, it is sometimes what we're looking for is a dopamine hit. You just want to feel good because you feel so bad. And that can be said to be true, especially for depression. And my clients who have depression tend to be very dependent on things that are very sweet because the minute you take something sweet, your brain lights up. You feel, not the minute, but as soon as it is in the bloodstream and has circulated. And so what you're looking for is that feel good. And that is how very many of us develop uh, cravings for sweet foods. That's how very many of us uh, have cravings for crunchy foods, because for instance, that tendency to want to feel that crunchiness, it has a tendency to be very soothing for the brain, depending on what issues you may have. So it helps with people who have anxiety, they feel soothed when they chew on crunchy things. And for those of us who have ADHD, there's a certain soothing feeling that we get. So um, again, why I keep going back to get a healthcare professional who can help you figure out the issues is, you're not running blind, wondering why am I craving this thing and I don't know what the root of the issue is. Then the last thing I'd like to address is with regard to um, what Jackson Fire said on with regard to culture. Um, I tell people culture is supposed to work for us, not the other way around. Like the biblical teaching is man was created for the Sabbath and not the Sabbath for man. What I take that to understand as a personal principle is question everything and ask yourself whether it's working for you. Many a client has walked into my office saying, I eat like this because I didn't have this growing up. So I eat meat every day. And I hear the statement, I worked too hard to not eat meat. You know, I'm not going to eat beans. I ate beans in boarding school. I'm not in boarding school anymore. Sometimes you need to ask yourself where that idea is, it, is coming from. Is it the fact that you went to boarding school, you hated it, and you promised yourself you would never have to eat this food again? Is it because you grew up in poverty, as one of my clients told me, and you had to eat green grams every day for weeks because all the other crops had failed? Is it because you ate cabbage in boarding school like Sharon and you swore that if you could afford to eat arugula, you would never look at a cabbage in a supermarket again? Sometimes this is just traumatic events or very difficult circumstances from our past that inform uh, how we behave. But let's also look at how they're affecting our health, one, and our general outlook on life, that we have these strong biases against things that may be good for us. And lastly, especially if we have partners or we have children in our care, what are we teaching them? Now, sometimes I tell adults, you're responsible for your own actions. You will survive your actions somehow. But when I walk into homes and I hear children say, I don't want to be like this, like mommy, or um, I don't like the taste of cabbage, I don't eat raisins in my cake, I, I tell myself, there's no way a five-year-old or a seven-year-old came up with this statement. And sometimes upon further inquiry, I realize, but daddy doesn't eat cabbage. He says he ate so much of it in school, he'll never eat it again. Even me, I don't like cabbage. And then the parents have this look on their faces like, oh, wait, I didn't realize. Kids are very intuitive. So even the statements we make to the household about, but why did you cook this food like this? It's swimming in water, you know, or why did you do this? Or when you're asking your partner at the table, why did you cook this meal? Kids are out there listening to a lot of what we say, and they watch how we behave with food. So when you cook something and you put it at the table, but you're serving yourself something different because you're afraid that carbs are bad. Your 11, 11 year old daughter is watching you and eventually the message she's getting in her mind is this is something I should avoid because she's modeling herself after you. So it's really, really important for us to watch how we are behaving and talking about and around food with our kids um, and with our partners and just anyone around us and how we talk to ourselves about health and wellness and our bodies and all that stuff. I think that will be in the second phase of this where we're talking about um, the actual body dysmorphia and such like issues. Back right. to so let me put on my MD hat for two minutes because it's, it's a Mkenyumbani hat. So the, 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 um, the, the issue of malnutrition that people don't think about is um, the, the 
the organs that take a hit are your large organs, you know, your essential organs, your heart, your brain, uh, and your muscles and your bones. So um, you want to be well nourished so that your your heart doesn't take a hit. Your heart is a muscle. The cardiac cardiac tissue is a muscle, and it might enlarge or shrink depending on what you're doing to yourself. So, like alcohol affects your heart. Um, all sorts of malnutrition um, affects your heart. So be careful what you do so that you don't affect that organ. Um, if you're you're under eating over over eating, your brain also takes a hit, and the brain um, sometimes can be unforgiving because um, swings in sugar can affect it. So you just want to protect those target organs. In terms of um, micronutrient deficiency, especially for females who have heavy bleeding, please see a gynecologist and please do not donate blood. I know we have this altruism thing of donating blood when your, uh, your hemoglobin level is 11, do not donate blood because you're losing iron. And when you lose iron, you start craving for Odoa, I had to say that one. You start craving for clay, you start craving for ice, you start craving for um, raw rice because it's iron, it's a mineral, it's just taking you to your the earthy elements. So if you're having heavy periods, please see a proper a modern gynecologist who will figure out why you're getting it and have it sorted out. People with endo, people with ad adenomyosis, people on various um contraception that's not working for them um this can be an issue md hat off oh wait sorry and and i know very many of us know to check for hemoglobin with regard to iron let's also check for our ferritin stores it's also the doctor the modern doctor that Posa has just talked about will be able to know what that means Let's also check, uh, let's do thyroid tests. If you suddenly have no energy, you're tired and, and your, your brain is foggy and you're suddenly gaining weight and you can't really explain it and you have crying spells, what we typically label as depression symptoms. See a doctor, please advocate for yourself, push for, um, for you to do tests for your thyroid because if that goes untreated for a long time, it develops into an autoimmune disease where your body is literally now fighting um, you know, itself. So let's check for that. Do that thyroid test, do the T3 and T4 test, advocate for yourself, do your research, get second opinions, please, 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 um, let's do that as well. If birth control is not working for you, if you have doubled in your weight in six months, if uh, suddenly you're struggling with suicidal thoughts, if you're suddenly struggling to get out of bed, if you and I'm using this very loosely, you've become a hormonal raging person, please also know that that is a sign that your birth control is not working for you. See a doctor. Some people are on the pill and they're struggling with micronutrient deficiencies because there have been links to micronutrient deficiencies when people are on certain forms of birth control. Please be informed and go for medicals. Go for medicals, go for those tests, check your blood, make sure everything is fine. If you have tingly sensations in your fingers, in your toes, if you're having disrupted sleep, go check for um, your micronutrient levels, check your calcium, check, check your calcium, go out into the sun. I am speaking to people who live in the city. Please make sure that your arms are exposed, your neck, your face is exposed, that you're getting sun about 10, 20, 15 minutes every day, walk in the sun during your lunch break, you need that vitamin D. Vitamin D works with calcium. A tradition that we have that has been um, sabotaging our uh, vitamin, I mean, our calcium intake, what our calcium intake, our iron intake has been the habit we have of taking tea or coffee with our food. <laughs> with our food. I know you love tea. I think it's the first thing you told me when we met. But if you're taking your tea uh, with your food, and I see this with very many pregnant women, you're, you're basically sabotaging your iron intake. The iron will get into the bloodstream in all that liver that you're eating and the chicken and the whatnot, but it's a lot of it is bound up by some elements in your coffee and your tea, your caffeinated beverages. Let's make a habit of just eating a meal without mixing it with milk, especially our vegetables. I'm talking to our people from Western Kenya, the Kisi Luoluya. Fermenting vegetables is great. It makes certain nutrients available for absorption, especially iron. F 
fermenting is fantastic. Malting is good. Sprouted foods and vegetables are good even for your gut. However, adding milk is sabotaging the intake of certain nutrients. So let's, again, why it's important to see a healthcare professional who will tell you this is the root of your issue. You know, let's make sure we are checking those things and we are consulting the right people. Okay, Austin, I would talk about this straight and now you're back. And, and the last thing I'm gonna say about um, micronutrients is because of the rise of high rises, you know, all those Chinese buildings we have in Kenya, we are not getting adequate sunlight. We no longer, we leave the parking lot from our jobs to the mall to we are, we are vitamin D deficient. We are not getting visible rickets, but we are vitamin D deficient and we won't uh, absorb our calcium well. So if you're not able to bask in the sunlight, do not be ashamed to go look for a vitamin D supplement. If you're in this side of the, 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 the hemisphere, um, please get your vitamin D levels che checked and swallow some or walk in the in the sunlight even if it's negative 10. Austin, when the um, um, eating disorders, I know we don't think about them in our setting, but just tell us the vitukwa ground ziko vipi. Just define, you know, the whole shebang and then tell us vitukwa ground. Thank you so much. Um, so one of the things we do in counseling, we ask our clients to describe their model of self-concept. Um, Is it me or Austin Hang? Yeah, we lost him for a bit. Okay, we've lost Austin for a. Okay, you're back, Austin. One I'm team. Back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we had a problem with our power. It just switched off. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Yeah. So, um, as as I was saying, um, we 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 do an exercise with our clients to discuss their model of self concept. Uh, usually, we would ask the person to say how how do they perceive themselves. So in terms of their self-image, um, we also ask them to describe their ideal self. So to have like an imagination, what, what, what would you want to become? Um, and most times this influences their self-esteem. So you'll find there are those clients who will talk about um, their body image in, in ways that is not pleasant or in ways that maybe they feel is not functional for them. So they have a negative perception of themselves, the way they see their bodies. A lot of times, um, clients who have eating disorders, um, they are influenced by their own body image. So of course, the question then you ask is, what, what is an eating disorder? Um, so you find these are eating behaviors that can lead to either serious illnesses or even death. Um, there are a number of, of these eating behaviors that then cause a disorder to the individual. Um, in Kenya, you'll find we've had treatment for eating disorders in addiction settings. We've also had um, treatment for eating disorders in outpatient settings, um, in psychiatric hospital, or even in a general outpatient um, kind of setting. and. In terms of the eating disorders, we have a number of them. Um, and a lot of this, there are certain vocabularies that come with, with, with those uh, eating disorders. So a person with an unhealthy body image may be at risk of developing an eating disorder. And these are the behaviors that lead to either sickness or death. The other thing that we also talk about um, is that when you look at these eating disorders, a lot of times they are influenced by the intake of food or the behavior after eating food. So the first disorder that we come across is what we call anorexia nervosa, in which the individual has a fear of gaining weight and either they starve themselves. Um, and so you'll find for them to feel successful, uh, for them to have a positive self-image, they start to monitor the calories they are eating. Um, 
some some of them will find they have uh, what you call um, sports anorexia, meaning that they exercise ex ex excessively. Of course, for us, you know that if someone has a, a good exercise regime, then it's a good thing, but there are, the, there are those who actually overdo it. And so you find because of that, again, um, they are concerned about their body image. The other, the other eating disorder that we also come across is the bulimia nervosa. And here the individual will have, let's say, a normal meal. Sometimes they would even have a uh, normal weight, but then they also have the behavior of purging, meaning that uh, they induce themselves to vomit the food, uh, to throw up the food. Um, we've also had clients who have used laxatives. They would go to the pharmacy and buy um, laxatives so that it kind of fastens um, the food output from their body. So these are the common um, eating disorders that we've come across. Um, we've also heard of cases of binge eating. Um, the individual here you find uh, they eat, repeatedly eat too much food at one time, um, even when they are not hungry. So you find there are those people who, let's say, they'll present to a nutritionist office as someone who is obese. Um, and then, or even in the counselor's office, and then we ask them to do like a food diary, a food journal to see in terms of their eating habits. And then you realize the person says, I eat eight meals in a day, or I eat six meals in a day, and I eat even when I'm not hungry. And because of that, you find that they, they have more than 20% uh, the weight that is appropriate for their height, um, the weight that is appropriate for their age, and also the weight that is appropriate for their um, body frame. Um, then the other thing that we also look at is that in terms of gender, um, treating males with uh, eating disorders sometimes is, is difficult compared to females um, because it is not not noticeable in males and it is also difficult to make a diagnosis of. But in terms of the effect and the harm, it is equally harmful. Um, and it can, it can affect uh, really anyone in terms of the eating disorders. Um, in terms of the treatment, a lot of times, um, so you'll find you will do a psychological assessment. Um, then the, the person will be taken to a medical assessment. There are a number of tests that will be done. Um, for example, we've talked about the TSH test. Uh, we've also talked about um, like having an amino acid therapy chart drawn for them just to see in terms of the hormones that they have in their body, um, serotonin levels. Uh, we also measure the GABA levels, um, endorphins. Um, sometimes we want to know if they have bouts of uh, hypoglycemia because also you'll find that all these also has an influence in terms of their intake and what they do after eating those foods. So indeed, um, in terms of the landscape here in Kenya, the, the, the treatment is available. Um, and there are a number of counselors, uh, nutritionists and doctors who are able to help in the diagnosis. Um, they're also able to help in terms of the treatment planning and also in terms of the recovery. How, what are some of the lifestyle changes that an individual can be able to ensure that they'll be implementing? So for example, if I'm working with a client who has uh, anorexia, there are certain things I want to look at. Um, if I have had access to their medical chart, I want to see how has their weight been like over the period they've been coming to that facility. Um, are there any changes in their eating habits? Um, are there any changes in their socializing with friends and relatives? Um, something that is very common, you may want to find out in terms of the quality of their skin or the quality of their hair. And then um, are they concerned about their appearance? Are they concerned about their appearance? So of course, with this, we can be able to start looking at um, are there any age differences? For example, if I have a client who's in their 30s or 40s, and I compare them maybe with a client who's in their teenagers, teenagehood, are there any um, age differences that I look at also? 
Then for clients who have um, bulimia, um, I want to find out, have they been engaged in binge eating? Um, then is there evidence of purging? So for example, you'll find a mother will say, every time so-and-so finishes their meal, they'll spend like 15 minutes in the bathroom and we don't know what they're doing in the bathroom. Um, in terms of exercise, what kind of exercise regime have they uh, implemented for themselves? So you'll find maybe someone has gone for a heat class. After the heat class, they go for aerobics class. After aerobics class, you'll find them in the gym floor. They are lifting weights. So you find someone has spent like three hours in the gym and they really have this excessive um, rigid exercise regimen. Then um, in terms of the physique, sometimes I ask the clients to show me their photo album, if they have, or even their Instagram, because you'll find you can be able to see if there are any changes in their cheeks, in their jaw area, you know, in terms of their physique. Uh, you may want to see the hands or the knuckles uh, in terms of the physical examination. And then um, the teeth, what is the color of their teeth? So you'll find um, as counselors, we, we are trained to do the mental state exam. And part of the mental state exam is actually to see the individual's appearance. And I'll be making comparison between the first session and maybe the other sessions to see that their, their appearance is, is, has some changes. Um, one of the things that I like to also observe in our clients is, are there any lifestyle schedule or rituals that this individual has? So you find uh, if the client, let's say, says ev after every meal, I go to the bathroom or after every meal, I'll lock myself in my room. Uh, I will be withdrawing from friends and activities. Then you'll find that some of these behaviors or attitudes would indicate either uh, I'm dieting, I'm trying to control the food that I'm taking, or I'm even really obs uh, obsessed about the, the weight loss. So these are some of the things that the, the, the counselors also look at. Um, in terms of the prevalence, I know maybe there are not as many studies that have been carried out here in Kenya, but the reality is we have clients with eating disorders. Um, they will present to our facilities, uh, some as medical problems, um, some as psychological problems, and then the facilities have to do the, both the psychological, the medical, and the nutritional assessments to be able to make um, a correct diagnosis and uh, treatment planning. I hope I've answered your question. Um, yes, you are. So, you're, uh, so, and in terms of the social street, uh, who's coming to you for um, um, eating disorders? Is, is are my Muluahi people coming or it's just my Ubabi people coming? Do we know? <laughs> Well, I think most 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 times you would find um, is middle class to upper class who will be presenting in our facilities. But it doesn't mean that, uh, because again, there's the element of culture and there's also the element of wealth versus poverty. So sometimes some of these disorders really don't come out um, that much for certain levels of the society. And do we know why the the why people get eating disorders, or it's it's um it's still a mystery. Um, we've had so as I was saying that we'll do a psychological assessment. Um, one of the things that I have found is that um we've had clients whose uh, onset of these disorders are associated with certain life events. Um, so I'm using the keyword there, association, as opposed to causes. Um, you find, for example, this, you can get a client with a history of sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, um, other times maybe family problems, uh, other times maybe a relationship has been disrupted or uh, terminated. Um, amongst college students, we've had those who have left home for college uh, or even left home for high school. Uh, so you find that because of these events, then they act as triggers. Um, the other one is about their thinking patterns. Um, we've heard of the 
cognitive behavior therapy where we talk about dysfunctional thinking. So you find um, a girl will say that they believe they can ward off pregnancies by being thin. Or someone will say that for me to compete in a man's world, I have to be thin. Or someone will say that being thin maybe is the only way to receive attention because maybe when you look at our beauty advertisements, they have thin models. So there's that element of deluded thinking. Um, the other one is about weight loss. Some people have dramatic weight loss and they are preoccupied with their food and their dieting. Uh, other times they refuse to eat certain foods and because of refusing to eat certain foods, then it progresses and becomes um, this, they become restrictions against whole categories of food. You know, like um, how Sharona talked about, there are those people who think that carbohydrates are bad. So you find uh, you have restricted the diet that you are taking for those uh, types of food. Then um, we have had people who have anxiety about gaining weight or being fat. Again, this is related to their body image and their self-concept. Um, I've heard of people who have consistently given excuses to avoid meals, um, withdrawn from friends, and also developed certain food rituals. For example, eating foods in certain places, um, having ex excessive chewing, um, rearranging food on a plate, you know. So you find because of this, again, they, they influence um, the development of these uh, disorders. Um, most times you'll find you are dealing with someone with a medical problem. And then because of that medical problem, that is now when we start to discover they, that they also have um, an eating disorder. For example, you had talked about the heart rate and the blood pressure um, and the muscles and the heart muscles maybe are changing. So you find because of this, maybe they presented to a doctor with a heart problem, but in reality, they also have an eating disorder. Um, other times, maybe they presented to a doctor with uh, problems with bone density. So uh, disorders like uh, osteoporosis, you find because of that. Um, other times they talk about, you can, they could be presenting maybe with the kidney failure, and then we discover that they also have uh, an eating disorder. Um, for students, maybe you'll find someone fainted in school, they're always complaining of fatigue, uh, overall weakness, and then we find out oh, they, that they also are actually are presenting with, um, with an eating disorder. Then um, something that is also common is hair loss. Someone is losing their hair. Um, maybe they will go to the salon and the hairs are just falling off and they're wondering how come my hair is remaining on the comb. Again, it could be because of an eating disorder. So of course, uh, for us, we, we try to understand that these associations could be related to four things. One is the issue of personality, how your behavior pattern is and your thinking pattern is over a period of time. Two, it could be related to your genetics. Um, so you find maybe in certain families, there could have been a disposition for developing these disorders. Um, three is about the environmental influences. What we see on TV, uh, what we see on media, um, the people we are interacting with and the places we are interacting with also could have an influence. And finally is the element of biochemistry. So of course with biochemistry, um, as Sharon had mentioned, uh, the encouragement for our clients to do their medical checkups, um, for those who are having the privilege to do that. If you're able to do that, do those tests, uh, whether it's the TSH test um, and all the other biochemistry tests that are available, because then they can also tell us, are you, are you presenting with, the, with these uh, eating disorders? Of course, um, Personality has a great influence. Uh, so your counselor, your psychologist, your psychiatrist will be able to help you uh, deal with that. Um, then the other medical, medical aspects, of course, the doctors and the nutritionists also are able to help you um, deal with that. And so in terms of the courses, so the courses for us, we try to do the categorization into those four broad areas. 
personality, um, genetics, environmental influences, and biochemistry. Okay, and um, just a note to the people listening, we are not able to adequately address um, uh, food sensitivities in people, uh, uh, people on the spectrum, you know, the autism and all that. So we won't cover that today because we, I don't think we have, um, uh, we have the, we will look for a different panel to cover that. That's a whole different topic. So excuse us if we don't cover that. Um, and the other, so I'm gonna move to to Sharon. No, no, no wait. Let me ask you, Osina, has the Ozempic um, craze reached Kenya? I know the drug is it's a, it's a it's a it's a drug used for diabetics. It's available yes. in the in the in the West for a thousand dollars or between six hundred and a thousand dollars. And um, of course, the people who make Hollywood what it is are using it to lose weight. Has the craze reached Kenya or we are still not? Because Kenyans afford a thousand dollars easily large. They can <laughs> idea. Yes. Everyone can afford it. Um, I'm not quite sure about it. Um, but I know it's one of those. Uh, I think it's the non-insulin type of medicine that uh, is used with diet and exercise. And we've had people who have maybe problems with blood sugar, uh, maybe high uh, high blood sugar. So it, yes, um, whatever is available. I think for for me in my in my own view, uh, if someone has the means and the knowledge about it, they'll be able to access it. The same way maybe we've had um, clients access pharmaceutical drugs as part of their addiction problems. Okay. So that's how, I'd look, that's how I'd look at it, yes. That it, indeed it is possible there are those who have uh, had access to it. Okay. So so Sharon, because this usually uh, is on the female side, um, I want us to look at orthorexia nervosa. You will explain what it is. And then um, the effects, you know, all these Facebook challenge groups for weight loss and also the Facebook challenge groups for, for hair products, you know, like you're losing hair because you're malnourished, but you're being told to slap on uh, Jamaican castor oil on, on top of it. Um, those things rile me to, to the end. And so just let's, let's talk about it. Okay. And just the inspiration, the pits, in, all that stuff, because it's mainly because on the Kenyan side, I'm seeing it more with the, with with our gender. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, most of my clients, by the way, over the past ten years, have been women, um, and they're the ones who I um, have had the longest relationships with. So most men will join my you know, they'll, they'll join me for coaching in three to six months average, they're gone and they're fine. I'll check in on them a year, two years later, they're good. They are living their best lives. But um, that also ties into emotional labor, which we already covered. But um, orthorexia is basically an unhealthy obsession. And, and I'm using this very intentionally, an unhealthy obsession with what people call clean eating. And clean so anyways there are so many things that are wrong with the issue uh or the, the just i want to break down the definition i think that's what i'm trying to say an unhealthy obsession with clean eating meaning people have an idea of health being clean eating eating a certain way and they've labeled it as clean eating meaning if you flip it if you eat the other stuff it's dirty it's unhealthy or it's toxic and we use that word toxic very a lot, like excessively toxic relationships, toxic foods, toxic everything. Um, this, I believe, is one of the biggest challenges of our time right now. And um, it's very easy to miss. And why is it easy to miss? Because the people who are, it, it affects everyone, so to speak. So it's, it's, it's in the individual who has been struggling to lose weight and has done 
has been dieting for the past six to 10 to 15 years. So they tried this diet, they lost a boatload of weight, the weight started creeping back, they tried another diet, then they stopped then. And then because of that restrictive eating, they went like, screw it, I want to do what I want to do. And I don't care if I'm fat. And Lizzo came out and everyone is like body positivity. And then they realize, okay, body positivity is one thing on social media, but um, even Adele lost weight. So I guess it's not as sexy as people are saying it is. And also I'm not sleeping as well. My back hurts, my ankles hurt. So let me still lose the weight. The dieting yo-yo cycle that, you know, is very problematic and very common in women. Um, so orthorexia comes into play where people start labeling food as good or bad strictly and then I eat this I don't eat this and therefore it's just characterized with a lot of restrictive eating so what are some of the things that you're looking out for to see if you're struggling with either orthorexia or some form of disordered eating um that's eating that's not normal it's it's not it's not healthy it's not good for you it doesn't nourish your body your soul your mind and you if you're constantly uh, engaging in conversations and thoughts about food, eating, calories, body, weight, that's a red flag. That's a lot of us, by the way. And then secondly, um, if your self-esteem is tied to your appearance, or if your self-esteem is tied to food. So for instance, if I hear any wording around, I think I deserve a slice of pizza today because I've been so good this week. I think I can afford a cigarette because I have eaten clean or I went to the gym three days this week, you know, for three, uh, um, I attended three sessions. Those are some of the things that I will usually look out for. And then if there's an increased, these, um, well, increased if we have been working together, but just generally, if there's a high, a high occurrence of critical or rigid eating. So this usually presents like this, uh, if someone uh, informs me that they have a weighing scale where they weigh their food before they cook it, or they use measuring cups to measure how much food they're pouring out onto their plate, or even when they're using the spoon to serve, they're counting how many spoons, spoonfuls they're you know, putting on their plate of food. Um, if they're very restrictive, just as you know, Austin has said, if they are being very, very diligent in making sure the portions are a certain amount. And then also if there's, I'm looking out for guilt and shame associated with eating. So if the minute you're just hanging out with your friends and then you happen to mention ice cream and they're like, yeah, that's such trash. It's not good for your body. Or the minute you mention chocolate and they will quickly, there's an association of certain foods with shame and guilt or not just foods, but eating habits. So if after you've eaten, if after they've eaten, they essentially have a sense of shame or guilt, that is problematic. So of course, if you put all these issues together, the guilt and shame, the restrictive criti uh, critical speech and critical thinking, and I don't mean critical thinking, uh, Socrates, I mean, being very critical of yourself, the way you talk to yourself about food, the way you talk about your body. If, um, as I said, when he was opening something that's very common, if you call yourself a pig or a cow, or you say, I ate like a pig, like I'm such a pig, I'm a disgusting pig, I'm a cow, look at me, look at my other, like you make these jokes, very self-deprecating jokes, and you laugh at yourself. And it's very easy to miss again, because very many people do it. And we usually look for it in people who are either very heavy or very small. Like if they have a very small frame, their collarbone is showing their very, their ribs are showing, et cetera. And there are ways to hide that. But the thing that we also often miss is that normal looking people such as myself do struggle with eating disorders and or disordered eating. So why our society, what our society labels as normal right now, what's very normal right now, and what do I mean by normal? Normalized by media, normalized by healthcare, normalized by a vast majority of people that we look up to or aspire to is eating that is very unhealthy. It's obsessively thinking and talking about food, calories, plate count, how much am I eating? I eat only a certain number of times a day. I need to do this, I need to do that. I use this supplement and it helps me with my gut. 
I've been using these supplements in helping me with my hair, etc. Whereas you could just be struggling with PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome does cause some women to lose their hair. Um, you could be struggling with uh, chronic stress that does cause people to lose their hair. And again, I tell people, go back to the root cause. When did you start losing your hair? What happened? What were the circumstances under which, you know, your hair started to fall out? And then go find out from an actual doctor what is going on. Our health seeking behavior as Kenyans is quite problematic. Um, we tend to, if I have a headache, instead of asking myself, where is this headache from? Is it because I slept for two hours, have watched eight hours of Netflix today, have not drunk any water, I have been living off of coffee and Coca-Cola for three days straight, or is it, you know, is it that? When you get the headache, many of us will just go to the shop, buy painkillers, and then go home. If the headache persists, even the drug company says, consult a doctor, what you do is go to the pharmacy and then probably get something stronger. Now, usually we will go to hospital when this headache is bad, you know, it's been there for, and I've had people say, no, I've had a chronic, I mean, I've had a bad headache for five days. I think it's a migraine. I'm like, what's a migraine? I see just a, a headache that won't go away. I'm like, no, not really. You need to get that checked. We do not, we haven't normalized checking. You know, when something is wrong, it's going to consult with a doctor and we need to change our health seeking behavior in that regard. We need to normalize going to see a clinical nutritionist when we have certain issues, because sometimes that's the foundation of bigger problems. I do have clients who are in their late 20s and early 30s with heart conditions that could have been prevented, with kidney failure that could have been prevented because of either disordered eating, or a certain diet history or a certain childhood issue that was not addressed. And it's very unfortunate when you're stuck with a lifelong condition and that guilt that comes with it and a pain of those consequences when it's something that could have been prevented. So let's especially look to uh, change our health seeking behavior. With regard to orthorexia, let's not believe everything we see on media. I know we've been told that those pictures are airbrushed, but do we really believe that? I'd, I'd not met a woman who doesn't have stretch marks. And when I meet women who look at me and they say, but I want to look at like you and I'm like, but I don't have children. Our bodies are not the same. Our genetic makeup is not the same. You know, the issues that affect me are not the issues that affect you. These are some of the conversations we need to start having with each other. Because when I, for instance, have gone on vacation with some of my friends and we all have different body types, we realize that I wish I had a heavier body because in our culture that is celebrated, but they wish they had a smaller frame because in their culture that is celebrated. And we're like, oh wait, so the human condition is that no one is really satisfied. Sometimes we just need to have these conversations, whether it is in therapy or just honest conversations in with a circle of friends to just realize there's something going on. Talk to someone, normalize and not and not everyone deserves your vulnerability, but find that one friend who has your sit down, shut up card. The one who can tell you, yeah, you're full of nonsense. Let me just tell you what the truth is. The one who loves you aggressively, the one who shows up, because that's the person who will probably notice when you start developing dark circles around your eyes or when, you know, there are certain things about you that are not normal. So let's normalize asking for help. Let's change our health seeking behavior. Let's start eating in a way that nourishes our body, not to count calories, but enjoy a meal. Just eat that ugali properly, you know? Eat, enjoy yourself, and start talking to yourself differently about how you look, because that's how you're going to change the way you eat. It starts in the mind. Back to you in studio. Oh, thank you. And Austin, for the men, especially what in the Sheng world we used to call Maweida, the ones who are weightlifting and in our setting um, they're getting anabolic steroids from god knows where and we know there's um there if the if it's unregulated they get the steroid mania and uh um, and all that are you seeing these clients with uh body dysmorphia the the people in my in my in my my entire people who are lifting and taking anabolic steroids uh the, the body dysmorphia and the side effects of the drugs are you seeing these clients it's not as frequent um, compared to maybe other disorders. Um, and the reason because also is because we have, uh, 
the social acceptance of people who are doing exercise. Uh, there is that the kind of admiration of someone who is a, a wader, you know, like he's big, you can be able to see, you can do an anatomy class on their muscles actually, because you see the different um, muscle types on their bodies. Um, however, we've had issues where, again, it comes back to the issue of self-concept, self-esteem, and their body image. Um, and because of that, maybe someone is uh, obsessed with exercising, uh, someone is obsessed with using supplements, um, a few are uh, even now using uh, steroids. So you find someone is using the injectable type of steroids, uh, injecting themselves with, on their muscles. Um, and we've had a few cases where the results have not been pleasant because of the side effects of those um, injectable steroids. So of course, uh, I know of a client who presented themselves in one of the emergency hospitals, I mean, emergency rooms at the hospitals here, yeah, and they had been injecting themselves. Um, apparently, whatever they had injected themselves with is a, a product from horses. So you can imagine, because they, they are really uh, interested in uh, building their muscles. So it's not common. Um, however, because of the social acceptability of people who are well in terms of their physique. So that's the challenge that we have in terms of diagnosis. OK. Um... So we are gonna do the 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 anything that I didn't cover, and then uh, like a take home message. I, um, but first of all, of course, Sire has to put on his religious hat. Um, the, the restrictions in eating. I know, like we in the Adventist faith, people make fun of me of the things we can't eat. Um, so the Islamic faith, the uh, Adventist faith, in terms of the restrictions, and the constant fasting, people are always doing for one thing or the other. That they could, yeah, just could you just talk about that that piece? Um, so <laughs> bad bad theology produces bad results. Bad implementation of good theology, um, or abuse of good theology equally produces bad results. So what you believe really matters and how you practice it um, truly um, matters. It's not neutral. I need to begin with that. So any um, for, for this particular topic, religions that are works heavy, okay? Religions that are works heavy or, and by works heavy is the belief that there's a deity who needs to be appeased by and and our approval with the deity um, is dependent on um, our how good we can work ourselves to be and normally that includes self-affliction um, quite um, an amount of denial for us to be able to gain acceptance so any version of religion that um, has that um, is, is is going to be problematic for today's topic because in such religious systems, certain things are seen as inherently um, bad or inherently sinful. And three things, there are many, a list of things, but three things that normally stand out in such religious systems that are seen as inherently bad is what they call the world. The world just means culture, food, music, everything. So the world is inherently seen as bad. And therefore, it either the, the objective of such a view would be to either dominate in the world with entirely religious idea or altogether avoid it, you know, if you can become a hermit. Um, the second thing that is often targeted by such wax heavy religions or seen as inherently bad is the human body, okay? Um, it's either called the flesh or cravings or desire or anything are all put in one group and seen as um, incarnately evil, that they're bad. Um, and so they either need to be suppressed or the whole objective of the adherent of such a system is to either avoid or suppress um, such things. And then the 
um, third thing that is normally seen as being inherently um, bad are desires. So there's the human body itself, the frame, okay? And then there are desires, uh, the desire for power, the desire for money, the desire for food, the desire for sex, the desire for, for various things are seen or often depicted as being um, evil and nasty and bad and need to be overcome. Now, with that religious prelude, it becomes easy to see why in such faith systems, and those faith systems permeate everything. There are variants of Christianity that are wax heavy. There is um, religions like most of the Eastern religions, things like Hinduism and um, Buddhism are wax central. Um, Islam is a very wax heavy um, sort of religion. Um, wax heavy in the sense for you to gain approval with a deity um, you need to uh, behave yourself into acceptance. So people of such things, because of the three things they see as being um, evil, the body, um, the body, the world, and the desires are seen as evil, everything is done to either suppress them or so handle them in a way that will gain approval. So you begin seeing people who instead um, instead of me going to look for a job or seeking to add value in the world, I'm spending time praying and fasting, decreeing and declaring that some money somewhere will become mine. Okay, that's a misuse of religion. The Christianity, for instance, teaches that you need for you to eat, you need to to work. Um, there are people who there there, there are places where the, the, the leaders have almost like occult mind control of other people. So. There is excessive um, fasting and everything. And the idea is normally to um, humble yourself before the deity so that the deity sees you've humbled yourself enough to earn their favor and their approval. And it forgets one thing, if this is Christianity, it f food and eating, but there is not a good idea. It's God's idea. It's God who gave food. It's him. It's, it's, not, it's not just an idea we came with and said, mm, it's kind of good. No, it's God who came up with food. He made it, um, he, he, one of the things that makes me not believe in evolution, funny enough, is how we could have things with flavor out there in the world and a body that is able to appreciate flavor. If these two things um, evolved independently of each other, um, there wouldn't be that case. But imagine uh, the belief that there's a God who created flavorful pleas and food out there and gave us the capacity to enjoy flavors um, gives you kind of a picture um, of the kind, at least in the Christian worldview, the kind of God is not opposed to food, but contorted views of God lead to people doing excesses, okay? Um, a good example to pick is what the Apostle Paul says in the Bible. He actually admonishes, for instance, against um, sexual abstinence within marriage. He says, hey, if you guys do it, do it with following A for a limited number of time. Two, do it with approval, agree amongst um, yourselves so that you will not fall into temptation. So the same thing, this endless fast, people are on a 40 day fast. And recently we've seen somebody who's died because of an attempt of that. And then after that, you're having another fast to um, confirm the previous fast is injurious to the health. Um, this is the temple of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit inspired that food should be created and given to eat. Now, we should not slide into gluttony, but again, we should not go to the other extreme of denying the body what it needs. Um, in order to interpret scriptures, whichever scriptures are well, you need a healthy mind. And a healthy mind needs good food, it needs good exercise, it needs adequate hydration, it needs all this um, loving communion and relationships. And so religions that make you then detach from community or avoid food or um, lose out on hydration, all in the name or objective of being able to gain a high experience, need to be questioned. Again, it's the same God who um, did come and create these things. Um, religions that thrive a lot on guilting or making you feel guilty or shame-centered um, religion as the key thing to keep you going and coming are down the road going to lead to mental health problems. Because in your guilty state, you will always be seeking 
there's a difference between conviction and always guilting. Um, conviction is the realization that, hey, I have sinned, I've done wrong, and I need to come to a God who's merciful and forgiving. But con keeping somebody continuously in the perpetual state of guilt so that they can always be um, seeking their God is not healthy, neither, at least in my um, biblical view, it is not biblical. It's not God's way um, of, 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 of doing things. And this views, this some totality of views that then seek to um, gain approval with God through um, dietation or avoidance of certain things, at the end of the day, produce an imbalanced individual, both mentally and also how they then engage with and interact with food. Finally, there is those people who feel um, it is sinful to enjoy certain things, the things that God has given, like to eat a meal and feel good about it while individuals elsewhere are starving, the things our mothers told us in order to eat. Um, we need to remember, um, at least from a religious point of view, it is God who provides. And at times he needs you to be full for you to be able to be used of him to provide for those other people. So you refusing to eat because somebody else somewhere is not getting food is you not appropriating the blessings God has given to you. Let me finish with this. When um, perhaps one of the Old Testament's most um, prolific um, prophets, he, he he's one of the um, three individuals who, according to scripture, went to heaven without the um, benefit of death. And so the other two are Enoch and Moses. And the person I'm talking about is Elijah. When Elijah was having a mental health episode, like when you when you reread re the story, everything there was, uh, Elijah was borderline depressed. He um, was having uh, a messiah complex um, that he was dealing with. Things were not going well. He just um, come from a mountaintop experience and he's slumped into this extremely big depression. He wrongly feels he's the only person standing out for God. He um, is, uh, he's quitting, like he's quitting completely. He's become suicidal and has vocalized to say, hey God, um, take my life. I'm, I'm no longer worthy. He's run away from his mission and everything. In all of that, when Elijah has done that, when the normal um, extreme believer would be saying things like, have you prayed about it? Have you fasted about it? Um, when God himself shows up, he sends an angel, he comes with food twice. He tells him, wake up, eat, um, for the journey ahead is hard, okay? So he touches him, which is restoring community. He gives him food and does it twice. I don't know what calories that food had, but the story says he walked 40 days and 40 nights. There's no indication he had another meal. Um, but a food that can be able to sort you out for 40 days and 40 nights, um, yo, that's, that's quite some food. And this shows you how God um, sees or engages with this particular domain. It's the same God who for 40 years showered manna that was adequate nutrition for the children of Israel as they converged um, in. So God is not opposed to eating. Um, Praying and fasting are important spiritual disciplines. Don't get me wrong, they're important disciplines. But when they are carried to excess because we're trying to, through them, gain approval or righteousness with God, it's going to definitely lead to imbalance and to excesses. And for such individuals, for you to fix the wrong ideology about food, you first need to go fix your wrong ideology about God, which is influencing and tampering with the effects um, on God. Yeah. Oh, that's what I needed to say on spirituality. Okay. Uh, to Funge Kituo, Sharon, your last words. And if you have any question, uh, please ask now. Sharon, your last words, and then Austin. Um, gosh, I, I don't know how to sum up everything, <laughs> but this much I know. Um, when I speak with my clients, and even my friends and family is about habit building, I tell them, it's, it's a gradual process. Um, healthy living, healthy eating does not have to be painful. It doesn't have to, it is not easy, but it doesn't have to be painful. It doesn't have to be a full-time job that occupies your mind and drives you crazy and drive you crazy. It can be healthy and tasty and fun. Um, you know, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. 
And so the one thing I would like everyone to take from this is that it's doable. Start small and start simply. Um, ask yourself why you do what you do, why you behave the way you behave, and then ask for help. Seek help from appropriate sources. Let's stop using Dr. Google. Um, let's, let's reach out when we need help. Let's ask for referrals from our loved ones. And um, let's seek the help that we need because there is help to be found. And so let's also normalize, I say this over and over, um, talking to a therapist about the issues we are dealing with. Uh, some of them are very deep seated. And lastly, you will not overcome the struggles you've had or the issues you've, you know, your issues with food and the messaging you got from your parents and your siblings growing up around food in 12 weeks or in, in four weeks. I know we do the 21 day challenges and, and such, but let's not set unrealistic expectations. If you got to where you are right now in 20 years, maybe give yourself some grace and say, I'm expecting to see some progress in six to 12 months, some progress, um, because we need to change the way we look at health and well being to make it more holistic so that health is not just a six pack. It's also going to bed feeling happy with the decisions I'm making and also waking up feeling like I'm looking forward to the day that's ahead of me. Thank you. Back to you in studio. Austin Caribia. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for this session. Um, I want to close with a quote from uh, Victor Franklin. Sorry, I've been speaking to myself without realizing. <laughs> so I want to close with a quote from Victor Franklin. Um, he wrote the book on uh, logotherapy, Man's Search for Meaning. And for him, uh, one of the things he says is that uh, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. So on the aspect of uh, mental health and nutrition, um, we need to either change the situation or to change ourselves in regard to what we eat, uh, how we eat, when we eat. Um, so that's the challenge that we're being presented with. And one of the things that for me, uh, as I close, is the aspect of balance, uh, homeostasis. We've talked about balance, balance in terms of uh, the food uh, quantities, balance in terms of the timings of the food, uh, balance in terms of how it affects our mood and behavior. Um, and for me, it's just to see constantly, am I able to maintain balance in regard to my mental health and nutrition? Back to studio. Asante uh, Nisana, as sire of the English of the news, Tufungie Basi. Um, so once again, thank you, Austin. Thank you, Sharon, for um, blessing us with both your presence and knowledge and experience. Um, please make sure you drop your um, contact so that any persons who need your services we can be able to make referrals. Remember, all you guys, we can be able to get, um, uh, you, you can follow up the recording of this on our social media pages, Authentic Dialogue with Sarah Jackson on Facebook. And then there's just Authentic Dialogue on YouTube. We normally upload the videos there. Um, like, share, comment, subscribe, um, and feel free to share um, topics and suggestions of topics you'd like us to address in the future because it makes a difference and helps us serve you better. Um, the age old question still remains, do we live to eat or do we eat to live? Um, I think you still can do both. You can eat and you can live um, as long as you don't eat and merely exist. But for you to fully live, you need to be aware, you need to be healthy, you need to be happy, you need to be whole. So I, I pray if for nothing else, today's discussion has helped you begin moving the needle in the right direction, that your relationship with food 
um, might be well. And if it is not well, that you will then step back and begin looking at why is it not well. There are so many things to make us unhappy in this world. And food was given to us as a blessing to make us feel all happy. And so if food is becoming the source of our unhappiness, we need to step back and reclaim um, the joy by addressing the misconceptions, um, the dependencies, and to use religious language, the idolatry um, we have constructed around food. Um, our next session, we um, this March, our focus is on core dependencies how we, the simplest layman language is how we use each other as crutches. And so we'll be having sessions around the theme for um, March is going to be um, around the issue of codependency. So we encourage you to, um, we'll, we'll of course be meeting a fortnight from now. And we invite you, wherever you normally get these links, you will be able to um, get the same from there. And I trust all will be well. So thank you so much for your time. I think as is discussed, Tom, we'll stop the stream. And for the things that people do not want to be broadcasted live, um, we can have a behind the tent, a small quiet meeting and behind. Otherwise, shalom and be blessed. Eat to live, live to eat, enjoy your food. Stay blessed.